Donc, euh, merci d'être venu à ce séminaire. Euh, donc, aujourd'hui, on a la chance de recevoir Atem Zorob, euh, qui est professeur à McMaster University euh, à Hamilton, au Canada, euh, et euh, donc, qui euh, vient nous parler de d'acier à gradient de propriété et gradient de composition. Uh, so now I will switch to, to English. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Atem, to be here and uh, to, to share your work with us. So you, you have uh, about 45 minutes and then, then we have a, a round of questions. Thank you very much. Excellent. Uh, bonjour and uh... Thank you so much for the invitation. It's really a great pleasure for me uh, to have a chance to, to, to visit your lab, at least online, and uh, present some of the work that we have recently done in, in my team with a lot of uh, collaborations. In fact, a lot of collaborations with colleagues in France from Grenoble, from INSA, from uh, uh, University Lorraine, and uh, through many uh, student exchanges also. Uh, so uh, the work is uh, inspired by uh, many collaborations, including with Olivier Boisiz and uh, Yves Brichet from Fr uh, France. And, and uh, I, I um, tried to put here some of the names of the students and postdocs who also contributed to this over the years. In blue, I put the names of the students who came from France to work on this. They came to Canada to work on this. And in red, I put the names of the Canadian students who went to France as part of our collaborations. And uh, it was really uh, a joint effort between our group and colleagues in France. We even one of our colleagues invented this uh, flag <laughs> to represent this uh, France-Canada collaboration that, that uh, we've been working on. All right. So to the topic of today's talk, um, if, if we look at uh, a lot of the applications, a lot of the components that we build, uh, they're not subject to uniform uh, stresses. The requirements within the component can be different from one location to the other. And yet, most of the engineering materials we make have uniform material properties everywhere. So it would make sense, it would be uh, more uh, appropriate for the design if we were to intentionally change the properties of the material from one location to the other in order to get optimized performance in different areas of the material. And of course, nature does this very well. If you look at a cross section of a bone or if you look at uh, uh, the wood in a long branch of the tree, uh, you find variations in the density, variation in the alignment of the fibers uh, with position to adjust the best to the stresses that this location is feeling. So that's the idea here. If we can start thinking about materials that do not have uniform microstructure, and uh, one way of doing that is by having materials that do not have a uniform composition, we can start to design materials with optimized uh, performance. So that's where this concept of compositionally graded materials comes from. Uh, the idea is to have a variation of composition. But we can, if we want, have a sharp interface within the material like we have in a composite. Or we can have no sharp interface because the composition changes and the phase fraction changes are very gradual. That's also possible. And uh, ultimately, the most exciting about these materials is if we can design the material at the same time we're building uh, the component or the application. So uh, we don't design the component and then look for the material. We do the two at the same time so that the material is optimized for that component. So just general examples to get a feel for, for this uh, topic. Uh, the idea is not new really. If you look at a knife or a gear, very often the outer surface is hardened by carburizing. So we have a composition gradient high carbon on the outside to give good wear resistance, and then the low carbon on the inside to keep uh, good toughness for the component. <clears throat> 
And there are many examples uh, where people also use the metal ceramic multi layers or they use multi layers and semiconductors even to reduce the misfit between uh, the different layers. So uh, the idea is used, but we want to see more examples of that. Of course, the challenge, the first challenge we have to think about is how to make uh, a material with uh, a composition difference from one location to the other. And we can say there are two types of approaches. One type is the constructive methods. So you can change the composition as you build the material. <clears throat> so that includes PVD, a very slow, but it works. Electrodeposition is another approach. Plasma spray is relatively fast. You can even think about powder compaction and changing the powder composition uh, gradually. Even in 3D printing, we can think about opportunities. Uh, I think it's not um, easily done nowadays, but with improvements in 3D printing in the future, that could be something that's easy to do. And of course, there is the more traditional approach of lamination or cladding, which gives multi-layer materials. So these methods depend on changing the composition as we build uh, the material. We can also think about methods where we depend on uh, diffusion, so transport methods. So the most obvious example is surface diffusion, as in the case of carburizing or nitriding of a steel. Uh, but if, if we're creative about it, we can even think about uh, segregation as a way of patterning uh, a fine scale uh, composition gradient within the material. So we've used mainly the method of surface diffusion in our research, and we tried to look at uh, ways of introducing uh, a composition gradient at the surface. Uh, we tried adding or removing carbon at the surface, and the advantage there is carbon has a strong impact on the properties of the steel, and at the same time, the diffusion of carbon is very fast. So this makes uh, this approach is simple, practical, fast approach uh, to make a graded material. The other approach we tried more recently was to introduce a gradient of the substitutional elements. And of course, that takes a much longer time because of the slow diffusion of the substitutional elements. But it can be done in the case of uh, batch annealing processes, which give up to 24 hours or even 48 hours of exposure at high temperature. So the plan for today is uh, I would like to talk about some of the examples that we looked at. I'll give uh, a big picture at the beginning with applications we attempted for stainless steels, electric steels, uh, gusset plates, which are used by civil engineers, and martensitic steels with carbon gradients. And then I will take that final example, the martensitic steel with the carbon gradient, and I'll look at this in more detail. I'll talk about the deformation behavior of these uh, graded steels, uh, the annealing behavior, because uh, we can get very interesting changes in the microstructure if we anneal uh, the deformed graded material, and the new, the new combination of properties that we were able to achieve uh, by using these uh, graded martensitic steels. All right, so let's get started. So the first example I just want to show, and, and that's very brief, is an example on stainless steels. So we had a collaboration for the last three years with uh, a startup company in the US called Arcanum Alloys. And um, they have a very original patented technology for creating um, graded materials with uh, a different composition at the surface. So what you're looking at in this diagram uh, on the inside here is more or less an IF steel. And they choose an IF steel because uh, it has very good ductility and it's also very low in cost. And what they were able to do was to introduce a high chromium layer on the surface. And if we zoom in, you can see here, <clears throat> 
there is about 60 microns of high chromium uh, region here. The, the chromium content in this area is about 30%. So as a result, this could be used as an alternative to stainless steel in some applications. And uh, it can actually compete very strongly with stainless steel because 30% chromium, uh, only the most expensive stainless steels have that kind of chromium level. And uh, then they don't have great ductility, but this material has great ductility because the inside of the material is an IF steel, which is very soft and very easy to form. And the cost is a lot less than the cost of the stainless steel because you only need chromium near the surface. So the process that Arcanum developed is uh, a very interesting one where they take the, the cold rolled uh, steel coil, the, the full coil, and they apply a slurry that contains usually a chloride of the element they want to deposit, so chromium chloride, for example. They, they paint that on the coil, and then they coil again, so it becomes a, a tight coil like this, and they put it into the batch annealing furnace, and after uh, a long time, it's 20 to 40 hours at high temperature in the batch annealing furnace. Uh, the chromium reacts with the hydrogen in the furnace atmosphere. The chromium chloride reacts with the hydrogen in the furnace atmosphere. That deposits chromium on the surface. And by controlling the process, the temperature and the time, they can control uh, the diffusion of chromium into the steel and they can control the thickness and the concentration of this surface layer. So it can be optimized uh, for different applications. So examples, this might be a very promising technology in the future. For example, to build appliances. In the case of appliances, the nice stainless steel finish on the outside is, is mainly for appearance. It, it doesn't do anything else, right? So having a thin layer on the outside will give the right appearance, but it's of course lower cost and also better formability, a lot easier to shape this panel than if it was made out of a stainless steel. Another application that we worked on for a long time was this uh, application for exhausts, uh, exhaust systems in cars. Uh, so the exhaust pipe, the resonator, the muffler. Uh, so this example here, this picture is a resonator that was made out of this material we worked on with Arcanum. And when you start to use this material for real applications that involve good corrosion resistance, good oxidation resistance, uh, it becomes more challenging because you have to worry about features like uh, the weld. So we spent a lot of time looking at uh, methods of welding this material because if you are not careful, you weld the material and then you lose this chromium layer on the outside and then corrosion will happen right along the weld. So we had to come up with the right welding method and the right filler to use here and we had to make sure that there was no gap in the chromium uh, layer on the outside that would create this, cause this material to fail. Uh, same thing here, if you look at some of these uh, parts, the, 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 the deformation can be very large during the making of the part. So we had to think a lot about uh, the formability of the material. And I can't show all the data because the company uh, wants to protect that information but I can show you the relative trend. If you compare to 439 stainless steel or 409 stainless steel, they are given by the blue and the red lines. And this material, the graded material that has the chromium layer on the outside and the IF steel on the inside uh, has much better formability, as you can see from this uh, forming limit diagram. Uh, the other the other steel that we are working with Arcanum on is uh, electric steels. So again, they had this very original idea of uh, introducing silicon or aluminum uh, 
into uh, a low carbon steel in order to create a high grade electric steel. So the most expensive electric steels have about three and a half percent silicon inside them. And very few companies around the world can produce these because you need a special facility to, to, to cast the steel and uh, to, to roll it. And then there are so many uh, decarburizing steps and so on during the processing of these steels. So only few companies can make them. But with the new approach, almost any company can make this because you can start with um, a low carbon steel substrate. Introduce this uh, paint that contains the silicon and then through a batch annealing uh, treatment, the silicon diffuses into the steel and you get an electric steel with good properties. And the best part is uh, usually with three and a half percent silicon in the steel, uh, the ductility is not great. But in this case, uh, it's easy to first roll the steel, then introduce the silicon. So again, there is an advantage. You separate the challenge of shaping and making the material from the uh, final step of introducing the silicon to get the ele good electrical properties. Another one of my examples, I really enjoyed working on this example here. Uh, it was a collaboration with uh, colleagues in civil engineering. And uh, with, with what they explained to me is very often they have these uh, trusses in, in civil engineering, like this component here, this component here, and they're joined together uh, through these big plates. And, and sometimes these can be huge in size. They're called gusset plates. And during an earthquake, um, very often these gusset plates can fail because of uh, cracking at high stress regions. So the idea that they wanted to try was to create a material where there is this band in the middle. You can see an arc going through the material here. Where through this arc, uh, the material is a little softer, maybe 20% softer than the rest of the steel. And then according to their simulations, uh, the material will not fail in these areas. So initially, we wanted to uh, decarburize the material in this region. And then uh, when they showed me how big the plate was, I realized it wasn't going to fit inside my furnace. So we choose a different approach to do this. In this case, we did not change the composition. We only changed the heat treatment. So we created these induction coils that allowed us to heat uh, the material along uh, the, the arc that they designed and uh, by, by choosing the, the, the temperature and the cooling rate, we were able to create a softer region in the middle of the plate, similar to the one that they had in the design. So now I come to the example that I want to, to, to talk about today, which is the example of the Martin Citic steels. And um, Martin Citic steels uh, are, are, are amazing. They have very high strength. And uh, the main disadvantage is uh, very often as the strength increases, the ductility decreases, and we have many cases of brittle fracture in martensitic steels. So our idea was, can we create a martensitic steel with better or improved ductility? And uh, we were able to actually make martensitic steels with up to 0.4% carbon that could be cold rolled in the as quenched state, which is quite remarkable. I'll show you in a minute and could achieve a hardness as high as a thousand vickers uh, in that way. And then by choosing uh, our uh, decarburizing treatment by controlling the composition and by choosing our deformation and subsequent heat treatments, we were able to create a very broad family of Martin Citic steels. And that will be the main topic I, I share with you today. <laughs> 
So let's get started by looking at, <coughs> uh, excuse me, by looking at these smart and static steels. And the first focus I want to look at is uh, the processing of the martensitic steel and how we can use the processing to create very original microstructures. So in our processing, we can have up to four steps. Uh, the first step is the step where we create the carbon concentration gradient. And uh, we actually went with the approach of decarburizing, of removing carbon from the surface of the steel. And after that, there is the cooling step, and that determines which phases we get, if we get bainite, martensite, perlite. And afterwards, we could use the material immediately, or we can deform the material and subject it to subsequent annealing in order to modify the microstructure again. So I'll give a few snapshots of what happens in each one of those steps. So the first step is the decarburizing st uh, treatment. And um, I put a schematic here of an iron 1% manganese carbon phase diagram. And depending on what temperature we choose for the decarburization, we can control whether or not we have an interface in the material. If we decarburize a steel with 0.4 carbon, so this is 0.4 carbon, at uh, let's say uh, 775 or 780 degrees C, you'll notice there is an alpha region here at the surface. So if there is zero carbon on the surface, we will make a ferrite layer on the surface, and that ferrite layer will grow into the steel. So decarburizing at this lower temperature will give a steel with a sharp interface between the low carbon region and the high carbon region. If we decarburize at a higher temperature, the same steel, but at a higher temperature, let's say at uh, 950 degrees or 925 degrees, there is no carbon at the, the, there is no ferrite at the surface. It will be a continuous gradient within austenite. And of course, we don't have to keep the surface concentration as zero. That's also a parameter we can control. We can make the surface concentration anything we want by controlling the carbon monoxide to carbon dioxide ratio in the gas. So we have control over the surface concentration, and we also have control over whether or not there is an interface, and we have control over the depth <clears throat> of the decarburized region by controlling the temperature and the time we use. So here's an example of the first case where we have a sharp interface, and you could see how there is a ferrite layer on the outside, and then we have martensite on the inside, and they're separated by a sharp interface. And uh, we could imagine many different uh, shapes, of, of this two-phase material that we can create by applying uh, a mask. Uh, so we played a little bit with uh, copper-based masks. They're very effective at blocking uh, the carbon diffusion. And one can uh, try to create uh, different shapes, and, and they're very interesting. But the main disadvantage we had with this approach is these very large ferrite grains at the surface which become a site for the crack propagation. So although this is, is uh, interesting, it looks appealing, in reality, it didn't have very good mechanical properties in most cases. Uh, so instead, we focused on uh, examples where we don't have a sharp interface. And um, one of the things that uh, we looked at is, is, is trying to um, see whether or not we can create more complicated shapes by applying uh, masking steps, just like they would do, for example, in lithography and, and create original uh, distributions of the phases. And, and one of my uh, uh, postdocs, uh, Dr. Sikoria, uh, he actually created an optimizer where you could tell it whatever profile you want, 
and based on the parameters that our furnace can achieve, it would propose a schedule to get as close as possible to this profile. So if we take this example here, where we have four regions of high carbon concentration in a matrix with lower carbon concentration, uh, this is, is uh, the desired profile that the user wanted. Uh, this here is the microstructure we got at the end of the heat treatment. So the different shade is, it's a fine microstructure of martensite and ferrite, and, and the different shade just indicates more martensite when it's darker, less martensite when it's lighter. And this is the hardness map that we get. And you see the good agreement between the two. We can more or less uh, get these uh, interesting profiles uh, that we want. So it's really an optimization process that involves uh, the heat treatment, uh, the phase transformation, and the diffusion. And ultimately, we can imagine if, if we were to do that on a big part, we could try to make adjustments to, to control the residual stresses in different areas of the part, control the hardness in different areas of this big component, and, and, and try to get the best performance from the component. Uh, next, just an example here on what we can do with the cooling step. So uh, there is the initial decarburization step, and then there is the cooling step. And depending on the cooling rate, we can make uh, microstructures where <clears throat> we have ferrite on the outside and uh, a spherodite structure on the inside. So these will have very nice uh, ductility. We can make something with... Uh, ferrite on the outside and, and perlite on the inside, or we can make, of course, uh, ferrite on the outside and martensite or bainite on the inside. So these are all examples from the same steel and uh, just different microstructures by controlling the cooling step. And, and and honestly, there are so many possibilities uh, of, of being very original with the cooling step. If you enjoy working on phase transformations, then this is a dream come true. And uh, we can we can, as I mentioned, the quench uh, to get martensite on the inside. But you could also have a step cooling where you hold between uh, the, the the MS uh, that where you hold such that for low carbon content on the outside, you are above the MS, so you get martensite on the surface. And for high carbon content at 300 degrees, uh, we are below, sorry, we are above the MS, so we can make bainite. So we can invert the situation. We can have martensite on the outside and bainite on the inside if we use a step cooling uh, approach. So, so many possibilities are available to us and we can now control, as I mentioned, uh, a new length scale, which comes from uh, the duration of the decarburizing statement uh, is step, and we can control the phases that form uh, through control of the cooling step. <clears throat> and I will show this result later, so I will skip this slide for now and go to... Uh, I'm, I'm just sorry about that. I'll mention that briefly. Um, so as I mentioned, we can use our material right away after cooling it to room temperature. Or if we wanted to, we can give it a cold deformation treatment and, and then anneal it and get new microstructures. And th this is one of the most remarkable results we have. Uh, this example here is the graded Martin site with 0.38% carbon. And we were able to roll this material uh, to a very large strain. The, the largest strain we were able to get in the lab was about a strain of two. And uh, when we did that, we introduced a huge dislocation density into the material, which then on annealing, we were able to use to produce a lot of very fine scale microstructures. So annealing at low temperature gave these recovered structures. A slightly higher temperature gave these very fine scale 
uh, ferrite cementite microstructures. And in some cases, we were able to make ultra fine grained uh, DP steel. So the marker here is, is, is one micron. So this is one very small austenite grain, which transformed to martensite uh, during the quenching. So, so this just summarizes the options we have in terms of the processing. And now I will try to give examples of what kind of properties we were able to achieve uh, from these interesting microstructures. So the first uh, point to emphasize here is the alloy we're going to use. So we used an alloy called 300M. It's uh, very similar to 4340. Uh, the main difference is it has high silicon content which makes it more difficult for carbides to form at low temperatures and the other key point is it has 0.4 percent carbon so a medium carbon steel and to make a benchmark for comparison we took that alloy we decarburized it to different levels so this is the alloy when you have 0.1% carbon, you could see it has high ductility, 0 0.2, 0 0.3, and of course 0.4 in the as quenched condition. Uh, the material is not ductile at all. It's strong, but it's very brittle. And if you try to deform the as quenched material with 0.4% content, it breaks right away. So this example here was a case where we tried to cold roll the material and you see immediately how it feels uh, along the shear planes. Uh, the, the total deformation before the sample failed was practically zero. It immediately failed uh, during rolling. What we next did was to decarburize this material. So we controlled the surface concentration of carbon to be around uh, 0.15. We found through many trials that this was uh, a good value. And we controlled uh, the hardness, and then we can measure the hardness that results from this profile. So you could see at the center, the carbon content is still 0.4. But at the surface, as I mentioned, it's just above 0.1. The hardness at the center is as expected, around the 700 Vickers. At the surface, it's much softer, around 400 Vickers. And you could see here, there is no sharp interface along the microstructure. The microstructure gradually changes from low carbon martensite and sometimes bainite at the surface to higher and higher carbon martensite towards the center. Now, if we just pull this sample in, in uh, tension, in a tensile test, we get the blue curve. So this is the behavior of this decarburized sample. And for comparison, I included here the behavior of the as quenched sample with 0.4 carbon, so without any decarburization. And you could see the important improvement in ductility. The previous sample failed uh, almost during elastic loading, whereas the decarburized sample, we can see clear evidence of yielding in that sample. And just for the comparison, I also put the sample with 0.3 carbon. And uh, you could see that the decarburized sample is better than both in terms of strength and ductility. So we can achieve properties in the decarburized material that are uh, superior to what we can get in a homogeneous uh, material. Impressive result uh, for me was the fact that we could take this as quenched decarburized material where the hardness at the center is still 700 Vickers, right? So at the center, the carbon content is still 0.4 and we could cold roll this material and we could really cold roll it indefinitely. We were, we, at the end, we stopped at a strain of two because uh, our rolling mill wasn't able to, to deform the material anymore. And you could see uh, we achieve a hardness of almost a thousand thickers. And for the material to deform by such a large strain, um, even that inside core of the material where the carbon content is 
even that region had to deform by such a large stream. So uh, I think it changes our understanding of martensite and how martensite deforms. So martensite, even in the as quenched state with 0.4 carbon, can support a very large uh, stream without cracking, without fracture. And this was a very interesting point for us. We wanted to understand why and, and how that happens. And, and this is an example here where we machined a tensile sample out of the cold rolled material. And you could see it, it, uh, it only uh, broke when we reached uh, a stress of about uh, 2.5 uh, GPA. So obviously that material uh, did not have any large defects. It was defect, uh, it had, didn't have any big defects. Otherwise, knowing the low fracture toughness of martensite, it would have uh, fractured at much lower stresses. So clearly, uh, the, the material was not cracked in the initial state. It did not develop tiny cracks as a result of the cold rolling. Look at the microstructure of the cold rolled material and try to understand why it does not fracture. Uh, we take uh, the material that was decarburized and we look at it at a strain of 0.5. I apologize, the strain was removed. So a strain of 0.5. And we can see on the optical microscope these tiny deformation bands. And at that point for this strain, the deformation bands uh, see the orientation of the bands seem to be different from one grain to the other. That's why I call them a deformation band. And we also see them very clearly uh, when we do an EB steam. And here's another example just to illustrate the point where you can see that the deformation in this core where the carbon content is 0.4 is not uniform. In fact, it's localized into these bands. And uh, because of the high deformation in the bands, we cannot index them very well, but the deformation outside the bands is uh, relatively low, so we can index it well with the EBSD. And as we continue to increase the strain, so now we go to a strain of 0.1, these initial deformation band uh, link up into shear bands. So we have these very beautiful shear bands that run through uh, the sample. And you can see how uh, in, this is the area where we have 0.4 carbon. The surface we have about 0.1% carbon. And you can see how uh, the shear bands form in the high carbon region, but they are arrested. They have to stop when they reach the low carbon region. And I think that's the main reason why we were able to cold roll the Martin site without fracture. In the normal case, these bands would meet the surface, create a crack, and this crack would cause the sample to, to, to break. But in this case, uh, the, 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 the bands are arrested by this softer outer layer. And as a result, we do not have uh, an origin or an initiation site for the crack, and we can continue to deform the Martin site without a problem. You can even see some small cracks on the surface here, but these are not dangerous because the outer surface has only 0.1% carbon, and therefore it's a very tough material. And if we look at the shear bands, we see examples where the shear bands intersect and from that information, we can actually estimate the strain in the shear band. And we find that the strain in the shear band is uh, greater than three. So huge strains within those uh, shear bands. So, so this, this gives us um, an idea about the deformation behavior of the Martin site. Uh, we also tried bending because there is a, an important benefit in terms of bending. Uh, if we have a decarburized material, the, the inside is, is very hard, but the outside is softer. 
So in terms of bending, most of the strain is on the outside. So one can imagine that this would be a perfect application for these materials with gradients. And in fact, it is uh, the material with the gradient of carbon, this red one here. When we do the V uh, punch test, we can achieve a much higher force and a bigger displacement, right? So the more we push the punch, the bigger the displacement, the, 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 the more bending we can achieve. So we could achieve uh, a smaller bending angle compared to the homogeneous material with out decarburization, which fails in a brittle way. And even compared to a material with 0.24 carbon, a much lower carbon content than our graded material. So in fact, those two materials have the same average carbon content, but instead of having uniform carbon in the graded material, we divide the carbon high at the center, low on the outside, and that gives us both higher strength and higher bendability. And the best part, the most impressive property is the spring back. If we look at a lot of steels, that have high strength, we can bend them. And when we remove the force, the steel springs back because of the large elastic uh, deformation. In the graded material, because the outer layer is soft, uh, we don't have as much spring back. And we see a clear benefit where it really outperforms the general trend we find in, in, uh, in steels. And that leads me to the next point about fracture, where again, we find that the graded material has a huge advantage uh, compared to the traditional materials. So in this example, we did uh, the so-called Sharpie impact test to absor absorb the, the to, to measure the impact energy. And uh, the idea we had was to decarburize the sample here around the crack tip. So we decarburized for different times to get different carbon profiles around the crack tip. And um, in that way, we were able to measure the energy absorbed as a function of uh, the testing temperature. And um, I won't go too much into the details here. I'll just show you the big picture here, where if we plot uh, the general trend for the Sharpie impact versus the yield strength, uh, there is a trade-off. As the yield strength increases, the impact toughness decreases. And in fact, initially, our material follows this trend. But the more we decarburize it, the more we can break away from this trend and achieve a new combination of uh, strength with improved impact toughness by decarburization. The, the other test we did to kind of assess uh, the toughness of these materials was to look at uh, essential work of fracture. So it's, uh, it's a useful test when we have thin sheets that are in uh, plain stress conditions, and it gives an idea of the amount of energy which is absorbed per meter squared of uh, material as the crack tears through this double notch sample. So I plotted here um, the, the, the amount of work, the area under the stress, under the force displacement curve, uh, normalized by uh, the ligament, the area of the ligament that the crack has to travel through. And uh, the important point about this test is the intercept here gives us uh, this essential work of fracture in units of joule per meter squared. So when we tried this test on a steel with 0.4 carbon martensite, all the samples failed randomly at very small stresses because the material is very brittle. So the essential work of fracture in that case is extremely small. We then tried it on a material with 0.1% carbon because that's the surface concentration of our material. And this is the trend here. And you can see the trend line 
and the intercept is around 120 kilojoule per meter squared. So that's a tough material. It absorbs a lot of energy uh, during fracture. And next we tried the material which is functionally graded, the one that has 0.4 carbon at the center and 0.1 at the surface. And amazingly, the points are very similar to the behavior we get. There is more scatter, but the points are more or less similar to what we have with the 0.1% carbon. So it wasn't an average between 0.1 and 0.4. It was actually very similar to what we got with the 0.1% material, which is a remarkable uh, improvement in terms of the toughness and while keeping the strength of this grade materials much higher than the strength of the 0.1% carbon material. And if we do some additional heat treatments and, and, and uh, grain refinement and so on, we can even get a material which has even higher toughness. So I will just take five more minutes to briefly show examples of what happens during annealing. So as I mentioned, we're able to deform martensite to very large strains, which means we already have high dislocation density in martensite in the as quenched state, and now we can deform it to a strain of one or a strain of two. We should be able to achieve a huge stored energy within the martensite. So in this example here, we deformed to a strain of one, and then we did different annealing treatments. At low temperatures, 300 and 400, the main event is recovery. Once we go above that, we begin to see uh, a lot of recrystallization in the samples. And I'm just showing here an example of one of the recovered structures. And you could see this area here is the deformation band. It's very easy to see. That's the shear band or the deformation band with very high dislocation density and very small uh, uh, cell structure. When we increase the temperature and uh, the time, we now begin to see recrystallization. And you see the recrystallization starts preferentially along those shear bands. So we're able to now take advantage of the shear bands that formed during deformation, the non-uniform deformation of the material to create a non-uniform grain size or a mixed grain size distribution where we have recrystallized grains along the shear bands and recovered grains between them. And if we're a little bit more patient or if we go to a higher temperature, we can get complete recrystallization as we see here. So although the material has now completely recrystallized, you still see the ghost or the evidence of the previous shear bands. And the reason for that is the grains within the shear bands are smaller, they're finer than the grains outside the shear band. So we can uh, use decarburization as an intermediate step to create these mixed mode grain size distributions. And this is an example just zooming in on one of these regions and you can see the extremely fine grains within the shear bands and then the larger grains outside the shear bands. And, and the, the longer, of course, we keep the sample at high temperature, the more uniform the microstructure will become. And uh, we can even completely normalize the carbon profile at long time. So I'll just summarize by showing some examples where the behavior of the graded material was better than the behavior of traditional materials. This shaded area here at the top is uh, showing new combinations of mechanical properties that we could get uh, by deforming the graded material. These are properties that we could not achieve with a uniform composition material. And then the shaded part here shows new combinations of properties that we could get by annealing or tempering the graded material. And I put for comparison this dark black line which shows what you can get by tempering martensite, uh, homogeneous martensite. So you could see the shaded area here at the top. These are the properties that we can get only by using a graded material. We could not get that by using homogeneous material and tempering it. 
So if we try to look at a traditional diagram showing the strength and ductility combinations we can achieve, uh, you could see how we can expand a little bit those bubbles uh, that are possible now by using the graded materials. So uh, I think I should save some time for uh, the discussion, but I just want to highlight how uh, we can use uh, non-uniform materials, materials with differences in microstructure and achieve uh, mechanical properties, corrosion properties, electrical properties that are superior to the ones we can have using homogeneous or uniform materials. So thanks again for your uh, attention and I'm very happy to take any questions. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, so let me 